So welcome everyone to today's webinar. Can, uh, can you hear me both Dan and Renit, all okay. the attendees? All right, fantastic. So once again, uh, welcome to today's webinar. Let me start by a quick introduction of myself. So my name is Fadel Altarzi. I'm the CEO of Nextford University. Uh, we refer to ourselves as a uh, next generation university providing access to high quality and affordable education to learners across the world. Um, our model is uh, simple in the sense that it really focuses on affordability and relevance. We aim to provide people with education that's uh, affordable, by affordable meaning affordable to middle income you know, citizens across the world predominantly, and relevant meaning that it's of high quality and we offer a skill-based curriculum. So everything that we teach is tied to employer needs and we've backwards designed our entire curriculum based on analysis of what employers across the world are actually looking for. Uh, today we have Ronit uh, from Localized, we have Dan uh, from GPSN. I'd like to hand over to you guys to introduce yourselves uh, first and then we'll, uh, I'll introduce the topic from there on. Ronit, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Fadil. So I'm Ronit Avni. I'm the founder and CEO of Localized. We're a proud partner of both Nextford and the Global Business School Network. We are a platform that connects university students and recent graduates with industry experts for career guidance and access to employers on a global scale. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Dan LeClaire. I'm not the founder, but I'm the CEO of uh, the Global Business School Network. We're an organization, a nonprofit organization of about 120 uh, business schools, leading business schools. Uh, and we connect those schools to business, NGOs, governments around the world to improve management education in and for the developing world, uh, emerging economies. Um, I think it's worthwhile mentioning what I did before sure. I mean, the GDSN, just in case. Uh, um, uh, it matters. I, I worked for nearly two decades with an organization called AACSB, and they're best known for accrediting business schools around the world. So I, I spent a much of my career looking at um, questions related to quality and, uh, and globalization and things like that in business education. It is most relevant. And thank you both again for joining us. Uh, and thank you for all our attendees from across the world. Um, you know, just to add some flavor, so Ronit, from localized perspective, I know you guys work with a number of employers across the world and specifically looking to, you know, link uh, students or, or graduates with em employers and, uh, and coaches and career coaches across the world. So I thought it would be particularly relevant for you to join us today, given you speak to both sides of the equation that we're discussing today, sort of the educators and the employers. Um, Dan, of course, you know, through your work with some of the top business schools across the world, um, you bring unique, I think, insights and data in particular in terms of outcome achievements and whether, you know, the education people are actually attaining is helping them move forward. Uh, but then again, to your previous career as an accreditor, uh, obviously accreditors are primarily focused on outcome achievements. Perhaps now that you're no longer with the accreditor, you'll be able to speak more openly and share with us, uh, you know, both sides of the argument. So uh, today's discussion really revolves around uh, MBAs. You know, are MBAs worth it or not? I'm sure both of you, as well as our attendees from across the world today, have been debating the topic of whether or not an MBA is still worth it in the year 2021. And to a larger extent, even though there are many who are still debating whether a college degree in itself is, um, is worth it. Uh, we love to see these uh, headlines all the time, you know, that Google and Apple and Microsoft and, you know, a bunch of tech companies across the world no longer require college degrees. And people are quick to comment on these Instagram posts and say, yes, you know, I'm going to take my chances. I'm going to go work for Google. Um, and then you have also the, 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 uh, wonder boys of the world and sort of the outliers, you know, the Bill Gates of the world who dropped out of college. So again, that debate has been going out for age, going around for ages today. Well, if they could make it without a college degree, why do I need a college degree? Obviously we're a university, you know, we think there's a tremendous amount of value in, uh, in a college degree. Um, we think that maybe there's, you know, a tiny fraction of the world who, who in the likes of Bill Gates shouldn't really be uh, our benchmark for most of us. Um, but in today's discussion, 
you know, I wanted to start by acknowledging that there is a reality and there is a movement across the world that's saying that MBAs are no longer worth it. Uh, let's focus on coding skills. Let's focus on technology skills. However, having said that, when we look at the year 2020, we see a surge in MBA applications worldwide. So we see, you know, the vast majority of business schools across the world, at least those offering, you know, online programs, um, reporting anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 to 30 percent increase in their applications. From Nextford perspective, you know, we saw a 300 percent increase last year. Obviously, we're starting from a low base as a, as a, as a startup ourselves. But um, the point is, there is definitely a surge in demand for MBA programs uh, worldwide. There's also pretty conclusive evidence that MBA grads uh, earn on average, you know, more money than their peers that don't have MBA uh, degrees. I'd like to just conclude this intro by uh, referring to uh, an article that I shared with, uh, with some of you, you know, ahead of this uh, call by Harvard lecturer, um, essentially saying that, you know, the future is a generalist future in the sense that, you know, those that will succeed in future careers will not um, succeed as a result of building a specific skill or a technical skill. The, the headline actually reads, no specific skill will get you ahead in the future, but this way of, but the way of thinking will. Um, so to that, and I'd like to just get your, your reactions on the, on the, on the topic. How would you evaluate from your different perspectives, whether or not an MBA is worth it in the year 2021? would like to start? I'm happy to kick off. Um, I, I think with as with so many things, it, it depends, you know, my answer is it depends, right? And there's a, there's a calculus, which is the cost uh, analysis, right? If it's going to cost you $100,000 to pursue $120,000 versus, you know, in the single digits or, or two digit, um, it's a very different calculus based on where you want to end up. Um, so it's interesting because I'll speak first from some personal experience and then and then speak from the localized perspective, seeing the employers and what they're looking for. Um, so interestingly, uh, just before I turned 30, I had applied for a fellowship called the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship for New Americans, which was uh, meant to give immigrants a, a one year, a, a um, full ride to graduate school and had applied for my MBA and had gotten into a, a, a top MBA university and had gotten this fellowship and wanted to do it online so that I could continue to work. This was a while ago. And at the time, um, they didn't see online education as being legitimate, that an online MBA at the time was not seen as being an actual MBA, and therefore they would not extend the scholarship to me. And so I had to make a decision. Do I pursue that MBA anyway and incur the costs, or do I not? I was running a media organization at the time, and I chose not to because the, the cost of attending was simply too high. Um, now, there are many days Oh, since that time, I, you know, I left my old organization, I founded Localize, that I think, wow, it would have been nice to pursue that MBA, or it would have been great, or where would I be if I had pursued that MBA? Uh, not necessarily with regret, but with curiosity. And I share this story to say that I think the world of online learning has changed dramatically, where gone are, you know, that view I don't think is au courant anymore, right? Most people see online learning, the, the digital uh, uh, learning to be legitimate, to be equivalent today in ways that they didn't 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and so that has changed and that has also opened up the possibility for alternative ways to create MBA programs like Nexford, um, and also for people to find affordable options that can work with their um, practical experience and also get the theoretical. So I actually think that the world of, of higher education is maturing because it used to be very binary. You were either in school full time and that was legitimate, or you were out of school and you were not acquiring the credentials. And that I think is a false choice. I think more and more, especially in this exponentially changing economy where so much is going to continue to change, being involved in the practical application of skills, understanding what the workforce is looking for, feeding that back into the theoretical, into the learnings, into the collective project-based learning is essential and is actually the formula for success. And so, um, so what I would say to your question, is it worth it? Uh, again, it depends what, you know, what is your 
um, uh, you know, what is your threshold in terms of the costs that you're willing to, uh, um, that you're willing to, to bear? Um, and then what do you want to get, get out of it? So from localized perspective, we have a lot of employers on the platform. And for some of them, an MBA is a prerequisite to being looked at as a candidate. So for example, one of the employers that recruits on localized is the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank. For them, an MBA for certain programs is required. You, you will not be looked at if you don't meet that qualification. And there are other employers that take a similar approach where an MBA is a recognizable standard. It's a proxy for quality. It's something that can help distinguish candidates if you're especially recruiting in a geography that you're unfamiliar with or in, a, in an arena where you may not know uh, the candidate pool as intimately. Um, an MBA can be, like certain other degrees, a proxy for quality. Um, and we can go into whether that's true and, and what that looks like. So I would say that that there's still tremendous value to pursuing an MBA. Um, there's the networks that you acquire, there, you know, the relationships that you forge, the critical skill, uh, the critical thinking skills that you build, and of course, for certain employers, the credential itself. That just needs to be um, uh, what needs to be considered is the opportunity cost of sure. what else you would do either with your time or your capital. Sure. Thanks, Renee. So cost, you know income prospects, opportunity costs, and sort of objective are your four evaluation criteria. Absolutely. Dan, what about you? Yeah, you know, I, I, I could have um, said similar things to Ronit and, and Nithado, but maybe I'm gonna back up a little bit and um, I tend to do this often. I, I, I try to start from the basics, right? The very, the very basics. And, you know, to me, it, when you think about management, you know, the, the planning, the organizing, the innovating, the decision making, the kinds of things that we do or, or help um, improve in um, MBA programs, there's a few things that I think are, are worth noting. Uh, the, the first thing, I know it may sound obvious to many on this, this uh, Zoom, but the, uh, the fact is it's pervasive. Right, we all do it, <laughs> regardless of whether we're working in a, a sole proprietorship, we're the only one, or we're in a giant corporation. Regardless of whether we're in the public sector, the civil society sector, or the or business private sector, we, we all do management. And um, the the um, point is with this that it's not something that's reserved for um, a small group of privileged folks, we all do it. The, the second thing, I, I know this again might seem obvious, but it's hard. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, I often tell people that I work with that management and doing it well is one of the hardest things there is. And running a business is hard, both of you know, you're entrepreneurs, you're, you're running uh, really important, impactful businesses. and. You know, I'm an economist, I have a PhD in economics, but I spent most of my life running a business, right? <laughs> managing a business. So it's pervasive, but it's really hard in the sense that, uh, especially the part about getting things done through and with other people, right? So when it comes to getting other people to do things that need to get done, you can imagine some of the struggles. The, the third piece that I always like to remind us about is it matters. The performance of organizations is a function of how well it is managed. The, the data, the, the research says so, but it's also been demonstrated that the higher performing the organizations in a country or a region, the better off the region is. That's why we do the work that we do at the Global Business School Network. We're trying to improve leadership, management, entrepreneurship uh, in emerging economies. So it matters. So when you wrap all this together, the, the point is that um, MBA programs are in some sense for everyone. And I'll, I'll maybe talk a little bit more about that as we go. There's, there's a program that can meet the needs of, of anyone and the constraints of anyone nowadays, especially with digital technology. A, a, a second piece is that we can all get better at it. You know, the, the, the fact is that it's not something that ends with the conclusion of an MBA, for example. And then thirdly, um, our organizations need it, they want it, 
They want the MBA. They want um, better managers, and our societies want need better managers. So, you know, when you bring all that together, you know, the points that you all have ma made is no surprise. The return on investment is there. The the um, the benefits to the companies and to the individuals are there. And um, maybe I'll just leave it at that for the time being. Um, so what, hopefully I didn't distract this. I kind of went back a little bit to the basics. No, you're right. And I think like, I mean, we have a question from the, uh, from an anonymous attendee here, which, you know, I'm cautious about giving sort of, you know, career advice to people when we don't know, uh, you know, enough about, about, uh, you know, their backgrounds and their, and their objectives. But, but I'd, I'd like to link it to your answer, Dan. So the question is, um, just saying, I'm a 24 year old girl, I'm a chemical engineer with three, three years of work experience um, in business consulting. I'll be joining a US based engineering firm. Uh, as a market research analyst. My goal is to become head of marketing or strategy in the global engineering firm. Is an MBA important for me or can I grow through my work experience? Is an online MBA better? So um, I'd like us to answer this question from, from because I think it's really a link to what you were saying, Dan. Like there's, this, there's often a misconception that we need to be pursuing uh, a particular career in order for an MBA to be relevant to you. Whereas from an expert perspective, the way we see it, and, and that's one of the reasons, you know, I like the article that I cited earlier by, you know, uh, uh, Vikram was the, the Harvard lecture I was referring to earlier. Uh, the future is just changing and evolving so rapidly. The needs of employers are evolving so rapidly as a result of technology and other factors as well, that if you were to essentially focus on a very particular skill set the chances of that skill set remaining as relevant and as highly demanded as it is today, you know, two or three or five years down the line are pretty slim. And therefore the MBA sort of provides you with a foundation based on which you can pursue a number of different careers. So you talked about the management aspect, uh, Dan in particular. So perhaps maybe you, you can dig into that element a little bit more. If anyone has a managerial aspiration, whether you want to become, you know, the head of your marketing team or your finance team or your HR team, how can an MBA or what sort of skills does an MBA equip people with uh, that can you know, be relevant regardless of the discipline that you, you, you plan to pursue? Yeah, good, good question. You know, I, I, I'm oversimplifying, but if you think about um, an MBA in sort of two parts, one is content. These are the theories, the concepts, the techniques, the tools that uh, are provided. And, and these are um, you know, things like, how do you calculate the internal rate of return on something? How do you design a marketing plan? Uh, things like that. And those are all Im important and foundational <clears throat> to any MBA. And I think um, always generally assumed to be there. Um, and, and, and those things are changing um, uh, as a consequence of technology and things like that. So there is, it's something that we need to constantly update, but it's also true that often these are found now uh, on the internet, right? Content is more and more accessible to uh, anyone, even um, um, beyond an MBA program. But where the real value lies, I think we, many of us agree is in the skills. Um, the, these are things like uh, strategic thinking, communication, uh, especially communication, and not just how do you present an right. idea, but it's how do you listen, how do you um, communicate in um, various forms around the world with different cultures and things like that. Uh, I could go on, but one, one that's sometimes forgotten um, um, I should mention those specifically critical thinking, by the way, I was going to yeah. skip over that, but that's, that's essential. Uh, but one that I always like to add in is what I often refer to as learning agility. Uh, yeah. More and more, you know, uh, at least in the conversations that we have, that's a, it's a big thing that companies look for, um, um, individuals need for success, uh, even without being a part of a larger company. And, and that's the, you know, it, 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 it might sound uh, more um, um, straightforward than it really is, but what they're really looking for is, can you take an experience in one setting and apply it in another? 
one that might be completely different. It's sort of how much value can you create from your learning and experiences, um, you know, even if not directly related. Um, you know, I'll, I'll maybe build on that in a little bit, but it's those kinds of skills that require practice, uh, require experience in the classroom and in, in a safer environment than in uh, the workplace. Um, and those kinds of things are what MBA programs, yeah. I think, increasingly- That's sort of cross-disciplinary, or at least yeah. what we, we refer to it as, you know, the interdisciplinary approach. So if you're learning about, if we take an example, uh, you know, many people are talking about how technology is replacing jobs and automating a number of roles. And some of the things you spoke about earlier, calculating whether it's rate of return or anything else. So we said these things are gonna change in the future. I'd like to just sort of push back here and say, I, I think the, the, the outcomes aren't gonna change. And that's what I'd like to maybe talk about a little bit more now also with, from, from Ranit's perspective and what you're seeing with employers. Everyone's talking about how the needs of employers are changing very rapidly. And I mentioned that earlier. But can I just take a contrarian view for a moment and say the needs of employees are actually not changing at the same time. So there's a set of needs which are almost perpetual. They've existed for 100 years and are likely going to exist for the coming 100 years. You know, things like critical thinking, communication, strategic thinking, the interdisciplinary approach, you know, and learning how to learn. These are things that employers value very highly. If you were to ask employers, you know, 100 years ago, they would probably rank them, you know, among the top skills they're looking for. And hundred years from now, they will also rank them. So what's changing is the how. So if I'm going to analyze today, what's the return on my ad spend? I may be using tool X. Five years, I may be using tool Y. Uh, you know, if I'm looking, how do I increase, you know, the efficiency of my production uh, capacity in the factory? I may use software A. And again, that's going to maybe I'll maybe use a robot instead of that software in three years. But the planning and the analysis process that goes into determining that methodology uh, is what I think an MBA provides you with. So what would be your reaction to that, Renit? Yeah, I think that that's absolutely right. I, I do think that there are certain disciplines that are changing dramatically. I'll take journalism as an example, right? It used to be if you were a journalist, your primary focus was to write articles, let's say, or to produce yeah. pieces. But now you have to think about data visualization. You have to think about the click rate that you're getting. You have to think about, there's so many things that are now being asked of people where, whereas before you might've had a lane, it is much more interdisciplinary. You are having to collaborate, I think, across many, many, more uh, fields than you were previously. I think the other area that employers are expecting um, that is different than before is in this realm of remote and distributed teams, right? Where, where um, it might have been in the past where you went to work for a corporation, let's say, and there was an apprenticeship model and you came and you learned and you worked your way up and then you got to some uh, certain level of seniority. And you're absolutely right there, Fado, that the skills were still you know, critical thinking and communication and hard work and, uh, you know, delivering on deadlines, et cetera. I think now there is a lot more um, uh, challenge around distilling loads of information, figuring out what's essential, um, figuring out how to tra uh, translate and communicate the essence of things in a state of infinite uh, information and possibilities. And in that regard, I, you know, I'll, I'm going to give Nextford a plug for a moment because, you know, it's interesting because we we work with over we have students from over 100 universities on the platform. We've got students from all over the world. We've got, you know, many, many partnerships with top uh, institutions. And it's been very interesting because Nextford is an online first experience, right? It's an online um, uh, degree. And you can see that your student body is incredibly comfortable. Like we are an online platform, right? So all of our interactions are remote and they're online. And there's an ease with which the next word students are able to take full advantage of the resources that Localized has to offer. And we don't necessarily see that with all of our partners that have in-person learning, right? So that it may be a, a, a more of a lift or more of a um, getting accustomed to building uh, deep, personal, intimate relationships with people, professional relationships with people virtually, right? Um, so I think that the skills are changing. I, I think you're right that the fundamental competencies are the same, but we're now doing it in an environment of so much noise and so much volume and the pace at which that distillation has to happen with the lack of oversight. You don't have the same level of investment on the part of employers to their employees for a lifetime, let's say, right. uh, of relationship. 
Right. Thanks, Ranit. Um, uh, can we move on to poking at traditional business schools for a second uh, without upsetting Dan too much? Uh, so, so Dan, you know, going back to Ranit's earlier, earlier feedback, you know, on cost, income, you know, opportunity, cost, objective. So if I'm a learner right now. Let's say I'm in, you know, in India, in Vietnam, in the Philippines, you know, and I'm considering getting an MBA. So I'm making whatever, let's say I'm making, you know, $1,000 a month and I'm an assistant, uh, you know, whatever, brand uh, manager looking to become a marketing manager and then a marketing director over the coming five years. Um, how do I go about and justify paying, you know, 10, 15, 20, $30,000, $50,000 for an MBA? Um, and then on the flip side, so let's say again, I'm in the US again, and I'm gonna go to a traditional business school there, a campus-based experience and invest what I would say, what's the average MBA today in the US? Maybe sixty, seventy thousand dollars Would that be fair for a traditional program, campus-based program? Um, yeah, it depends on the set you include in making that calculation. Uh, if you include a, a wider range of programs, of course, it could be lower. Um, if you yeah. narrow it to a smaller set, you can narrow it in a way that makes it quite a bit higher too. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so let's say average is, 40, 50,000, for example. So again, the, the question is, you know, how does one, how should one actually think about the return on that investment? Uh, if you are giving advice to someone, you know, thinking about getting an MBA, what sort of time frame they should they look at? And should they actually look at it purely as an investment where I'm investing, you know, $10, I expect to get back $20 over X number of years. Sure. Um, so Oh boy, those are, there are a lot of questions there and I can get to them all, but I'm going to start with the last one. You know, I do always, I've always encouraged people to think beyond uh, um, dollars for questions related to return on investment and to think longer term than the next three years, for example. Okay. And, you know, that's when I think certain questions regarding the extent to which you want to um, uh, associate with a particular set of alumni. Those are uh, instances where you're looking for access to different kinds of ecosystems. You know, those kinds of questions begin to present differences across the, the programs that are available. So it's not just a question of, you know, here's an MBA and there are, you know, 13 different ways in which you can earn it. It's, yeah. um, it's a, it depends on a lot of factors. And as I mentioned before, you know, the beautiful part about today's world is, is there's an MBA program that fits the aspirations, the goals and objectives, and, and the constraints of everyone in some way or another. So when you go back to your, your fundamental question, number one, look, think long term, not just short term. What's long term? Five years, 10 years, 20 years? Yeah, um, longer than the next, your first job, especially. Sometimes, okay. especially parents working with their uh, young adults often have a, an extraordinary focus on the first job, whereas the first job is really an entry point to a career that might uh, take you in different directions. So think longer term, think beyond initially just the return in terms of, uh, of dollars. And those things will change, of course, over time, depending on your experience. Remember, as soon as you earn your degree, then um, you start gaining experiences or you already have experiences and continue to gain experiences. And the, the fact is the degree is only one part of what makes a person um, experienced, knowledgeable um, and capable in our world. So, so think longer term. But going back again to the central question, you know, my, my advice to everyone, just like Ronit uh, said earlier, is really spend a lot of time understanding yourself. And there are so many tools that are available today that weren't available in the past um, to understand the areas of uh, strength, to get a better understanding about the areas that you'd like to um, really pursue research. Although we make a big deal out of general generalists today, um, at least in my experience, there's um, more and more interest in the T shape, right? Where you have these broad skills that cut across anything, but then you have some degree of depth in your experience and can carry that into the next job and build on it and, and leverage that 
horizontally as well as vertically. So there are a lot of things to consider. Um, don't just focus on um, especially the first job um, right. or the immediate job after graduation. Right. Um, let's take a quick question. There's a number of questions here. So Arslan is asking, um, is an MBA worth it or updated in curriculum for remote jobs in the COVID-19 era? And secondly, how does MBA help in getting remote jobs? Um, so it's, it's a great question. You know, lots of people right now are looking at remote jobs, whether in their own countries or a, outside of their countries. And, you know, in starting Nextford, that was a fundamental you know, part of the fundamental reason why we started Nextford, we, we, we claim that the world, or we see that the world's moving towards what we call this virtual talent grid. So, so this is virtual grid that exists, uh, connecting people across the world. And if you have an internet connection, you know, that's the first step to get on that grid. And then once you get on that grid, all you need is really the right skills. So once you have the right skills, you have access all of a sudden to you know, economic opportunities from all across the world, regardless of where you live. And that's a very powerful, uh, you know, uh, uh, I would say shift in the global workforce that you know, wasn't gonna be possible you know, 30 or 40 years ago. Um, now, because of connectivity, as well as the you know, online education, um, it's possible for people to access jobs that they need across the world, that are available across the world, but also, there's a huge shift that's going to happen inevitably over the coming decade as you have aging populations in the quote unquote in the Western world, whether it's in the US or the UK, versus much younger populations in Sub Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. So, you know, one has to assume that the only option is going to start being to hire people from across the world, um, have them fulfill these jobs regardless of their location. So, to, to Arslan's question, um, when one's considering an MBA, um, you know, is it fair to assume that an online MBA is probably going to be better equipped uh, to help you pursue these remote jobs? Because by virtue of you learning to, to learn online compared to offline, or would you say not necessarily? Renate, do you want to go out? I would say two things. So there's no question that if you're comfortable in an online learning environment, it's going to be easier for you. You will have already had to master certain skills like figuring out how to communicate uh, asynchronously, how, figure out how to collaborate across geographies and time zones, figure out how to self-manage in terms of your time. It's, it's, there's a lot more discipline required to follow a program that is remote from your home than it is to go immerse yourself in an environment where everything's structured around you attending class you know, eating on schedule where everything's kind of moving in the, in, the, in the same direction. One is not better than the other. You just have to know yourself. If you're an extroverted person who needs to be around actual humans, both at the workplace and in a school environment, you're probably better off in an, in an in-person experience if your life cir circumstances permit, right? You're not, let's say, a, a caregiver or have dependents where you need to be with them. If you're somebody that has that discipline, then I think that there are some incredible advantages to doing it online because you can either be working at the same time to maintain your skills in the workforce or to learn all of these uh, collaborative new disciplines that are really important. Um, but to your other question, Fadl, and to your other point, I, I do wanna give an example um, about, if, you know, if you are working with an online degree program or a new program, let's say, you know, Nextford is new, right? And so you've really put a premium on um, being relevant and up to date and, and curating everything to make it um, an experience where people are keeping up with what industry wants, which is really important. Now, from an employer perspective, um, some employers may not be familiar with Nextword. And so they may not yet know what is the quality or caliber of Nextword. And in a situation like that, what I would encourage is that, um, and, and we see this on Localize, where if you're, if you're a student and you have a profile, um, we, all, we wanna see demonstrations of your agency, right? So we wanna see your projects. Have you done projects? In what ways have you exhibited leadership that can then tell us, okay, you're studying online, you're acquiring these skills, and you're also somebody who's proactive and who is um, taking on leadership roles. And I'll, just to give an analogy, right now, you know, our team is distributed. We have team members in Lagos and Cairo and Istanbul and Ramallah and, and Silicon Valley and London. And um, 
we're hiring right now some several engineering positions. Now, if you're applying to us and you're coming from Google, Google is a proxy for us for quality. We don't know that you as an individual are an excellent in engineer. We don't necessarily know that, but we know that there is a reasonable expectation that Google has done their diligence. And if you're coming through Google, that there's a baseline that we can rely on. And then we want to see if it's a personality fit and, and you know the other things line up. I think that it's similar, whereas another engineer who's applying, if they're coming from a company we're not familiar with, we're going to want to see what projects they've done. Where have they shown leadership? What have they accomplished? So it what the onus shifts from the brand to their actual behaviors. And one could argue that that's actually a better gauge, right? Like what has this specific person done to, to show that they have the skills and the capability, the skill plus will to get the job done. So, um, you know, if you're doing an online program like Nextford or like, you know, or any frankly program, you're going to want to find ways to showcase a, por a portfolio and to think about your work in those terms so that employers are able to decipher, even if they're not familiar with the degree um, in terms of its, its, its caliber in their mind, whether accurate or not, um, you're gonna wanna be able to stand out. Sure, uh, thanks. Really. We have a really interesting question, Dan, maybe you could take this one from, uh, I think it's Bubel or uh, saying good morning. You know, I'd like to know, are MBAs evolving with time? And if so, does that mean one should pursue an MBA every 10 years or so? <laughs> it's an interesting way to think about it, right? Where you're saying, you know, if things are it changing, is, you need to learn is. new stuff. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, the, um, let me answer the last question very directly. I don't think it's necessary to pursue an MBA every 10 years. Um, but there is some... Um, um, historical context around this, you know, many different kinds of MBAs, full-time, part-time, executive, you know, take an executive MBA. This is typically for people later in their career. And a lot of the benefit of that is to bring together other people later in their career with these different kinds of experiences in different industries. So it does happen. Um, I, you know, I think especially today, it's, it's important to realize um, one of, the, one of the big changes, we always kind of make this assumption that people take their education from one provider, right? You, you go to undergraduate, right. you go to MBA. <laughs> Today, it's, it's um, people take their education from multiple providers. At the same time, we're taking an MBA online, we're, we're taking a course locally in the community, we're um, 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 part of a book club. There's a lot of ways that we learn and keep up. I do think though that it's important and one of the benefits of being a part of a, an institution um, is, to, is to remain connected with your alma mater because they, they um, are there for you increasingly for the rest of your career. Uh, and that's the way we think about this. And, and business schools are adapting, you know, the, um, not only the new ones, but the existing ones. It's, it's impossible, I think now to, find a, a quote unquote traditional business school that doesn't have an online offering, right? And uh, many of those online offerings are designed to connect with alums in a continuous basis. Um, yeah. But it is definitely, definitely um, important in this era that you don't stop learning when you get a degree, an MBA or otherwise. Um, this is one of the the big things. I do a presentation called Learning in the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and it is, it is central. Um, it's right, the reason right. why people succeed in addition to grit and other things. Definitely. Yeah, we like to call it, you know, I think if nothing else, if you don't think communication skills or strategic thinking or critical thinking, if none of these skills you find important, it's, you know, it's learning how to learn. I would say that's, you know, the most valuable skill you're going to get from a college degree. And, you know, we have a number of questions you know, about certificates. So people are like, you know, uh, I've gotten a recommendation to get a bunch of certificates. That's better than getting an MBA. Um, and I don't, I'd like to share my perspective and then feel free to jump in as well. Like my perspective to Renit's point on evaluating the value um, or the worth of a credential has become very challenging in the world of these you know, alternative credentials. So there's almost become like an overload right now of you know badges and certificates and you know dozens and you know there's thousands of these micro credentials one can get right now. Some of which you pay twenty dollars and you get. Others you actually have to do stuff to get. So 
I think from an employer perspective, that has actually given the traditional college degree higher value, contrary to what people thought was going to happen over the past, uh, past years. Because everyone now loads their CV with a whole bunch of credentials that it's unclear what those actually mean. You know, a college degree at least gives a baseline when an employer looks and sees an MBA, they know what an MBA means. Now, obviously, not all MBAs are created equal. But there's a minimum baseline that an MBA provides, which, you know, a badge from website X or Y doesn't. Would you guys agree with that assessment? I think it depends what you're hiring for, right? If I'm, if I'm hiring for uh, a salesperson and we're using HubSpot as our CRM, right, right um, then I may look for what did they, how, you know, what was their sales volume and, and what leadership did they show and do, do they know HubSpot? But on the other hand, I, I think that, you know, the certificates don't, so here's, here's the value that I think you get. First of all, you get um, an institution that is curating for you, that's looking at all this mass volume of all the things you could be studying, right? All the opportunities, which are almost endless. And they're saying, hey, we're going to, we're going to stay up to date on the latest data, latest research, latest uh, ways of thinking, ways of applying your knowledge. And we're going to curate a pathway for you that has a recognizable credential at the end of it that is still valued. Right. And there's something incredibly reassuring about that, that it's not on you to then have to evaluate every micro credential to figure out whether it's legitimate or not, figure out how you measure up or not. Right. So so that as an investment and also to do some of the fundamentals. Right. So to the question that was asked earlier, you don't have to restudy theories of pricing strategy every 10 years. You can study about pricing strategy once and then you can brush up on new models over the course of your career or your lifetime, right? So there's something foundational. There's an advantage to getting that foundational learning. And um, so I think, again, if it's affordable and you can and you can work it in or it aligns with your um, what ecosystem you want to be part of, I do think that there is still tremendous value. Um, do I think it's worth people going hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars into debt for? It, again, really depends on, 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 on what their plans are, where they want to be, et cetera. So that's where I would, I would do that analysis. And luckily for NextWord, that's not, you're not asking that of your students. You, you don't want to see them uh, uh, reach that, that kind of situation. Yeah, to, to add to that, I mean, definitely, yeah, we, we don't want people to, to have to, to get into debt that they're going to have to pay over, you know, 20 year basis. Uh, we think there has to be a direct return that's tangible, that's clear, that's, you know, uh, that's, you know, that's achieved over a, a finite period of time. Um, but having having said that, what's the trade off between real world, exp real world experience and MBAs? I mean, from an expert perspective, we tell people, there shouldn't be a trade-off. That should not be a choice you have to make, right? Uh, on the contrary, we think, you know, they serve different purposes and they're highly complementary to each other. Uh, but I see a question from John, from a number of others, you know, asking similar questions. Am I not better off focused on getting more experience as opposed to going into an MBA? Dan, how would you answer that? Yeah. You know, uh, unfortunately, I think um, still today, it, you don't, earn a credential by going through experience, right? And so, so from one perspective, experience matters. It's helpful, it, 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 um, especially if you can learn from that experience, but, but, but you don't get a credential from it, uh, one that has right. value across different sectors and things like that. So that, that's, that's one thing. But the, uh, the other piece that I, I often emphasize, one of the, the things we know about the future of education, as I mentioned before, content is more and more accessible. So often the reason why education matter is because of the experiences they provide, right? And the way it's provided in a semi-safe environment, right? Um, more and more we realize that our role in education is to curate not just the content, but the experiences to put learners in a position to learn and to give the feedback and, and um, a coaching necessary for them to learn from that experience. So it's not, um, it doesn't derail your career to make a mistake in your MBA finance course, but it might very well derail your career in the workplace. So, you know, to get those kinds of experiences, I think are, are increasingly important as part of the education 
um, variable in the in the equation, not the not the workplace experience variable. Right, right. We have another question from an anonymous um, attendee asking about what are specific examples of jobs either of you have seen um, where an MBA is actually a requirement. So Renit mentioned IFC uh, jobs earlier. What would be other examples of either from specific employers or specific occupations where an MBA is actually an actual requirement? I see it quite a bit in the more um, multinational, uh, uh, multilateral institutions, whether it's, you know, UN type of institutions, again, we, you know, talking about the IFC World Bank, those types of institutions in finance, in certain um, uh, finance and banking related institutions, we see that more. Um, so it really depends. Yeah. And be careful, yeah. even if not openly or explicitly stated that it's a requirement, it's often an expectation because of the people that you're competing with for those jobs, right? <laughs> Who do yeah. have anyway. So I would be a little bit uh, careful about that. What about from a startup perspective? So, uh, you know, we have a number of people here working either at their own, start, building their own startups or family businesses. So we have someone saying I'm in construction, so startup company. You know, how will an MBA benefit me if I'm, you know, in a SME or a startup? Yeah, since both of you are so much more experienced as entrepreneurs, I want to take a stab at this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us. Yeah, uh, from, from the from the uh, provider perspective, from the university perspective, this is something that's become very important. It, but what I want to emphasize is that not only are MBA programs thinking um, more about how to uh, provide support for entrepreneurial skills and motivation, that sort of thing, but in, increasingly they're building a set of resources um, that help beyond the education part. So, um, you know, think about um, access to potential funders, think about mentors from the alumni community and all those kinds of things that provide sort of the support structure for, for, for entrepreneurs. This is one of the things I've seen really a, a, a big shift in uh, business education for it's not just for people who um, wanna take jobs in um, business, but who wanna create them through their own work. Um, but let me stop there since both of you again have so much more experience as entrepreneurs. I'm thinking about financial modeling, right? So I'm thinking, for example, so so we've had to go through several rounds of we've we've raised several rounds of um, investment, including from you know angel and venture capital uh, investors. And you have to have financial models, right? And and those models have to be pretty detailed. And um, and you have to be able to either build the model ideally or deeply understand it at a granular level. And I think. Um, uh, MBAs are not the only way to do that, but I think it's a great way where if you're, if you're in an environment where you, the stakes are a little bit lower, you can workshop things, you can learn, you can get feedback, you can practice, um, you can, you know, get through the ins and outs, really understand, you know, concepts around lifetime value and the cost of acquisition and, and um, uh, really thinking through all of the unit economics. And I think that that's especially true um, for underrepresented founders, right? If you're a female, if you're a, um, in the United States, if you're, if you're not a white founder and, and you know, um, uh, there is all kinds of data that shows that people are, you um, are underestimated and not taken seriously. And so having the confidence based on the knowledge of um, the, the accuracy of your, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that your, you know, projections are always projections and everyone knows with, with the startups and, and with early stage companies, lots can happen, lots can go wrong, but really deeply understanding why are you choosing the pricing model that you're choosing? Why are you designing the financial model that you're designing? Why are you going after the kinds of capital that you're going after? And that's true. I used to be in the nonprofit sector. You know, I was dealing with budgets. I was dealing with projections. You have board presentations, things like that. So it's not that you can't do it without, and I don't have an MBA, um, although I have taken online courses in accounting and statistics. I have taken uh, short executive uh, uh, MBA type programs several weeks at a time. Um, it's not that you can't, but if you 
if you have the ability and spaciousness to take some time to really focus in on those skills and get that foundational learning, um, it'll just make it faster as you move forward in the future. Um, so that, that's how I see some of the key advantages. And then frankly, the relationships and networks, right? If you're, if you're um, building relationships with people who have complementary competencies, those people could become co-founders, right? Like the number one reason why startups fail is co-founder friction. And so if you actually have a track record of working with somebody, if you found people from a diverse pool that you have uh, relationships of trust with that have complementary skills, that based on experience, you see no things that you don't know and that you like them and their work style, that's a fantastic pool from which to choose collaborators for future endeavors. Thanks, Renit. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I completely agree. The only thing I'd add to that is really, it's it's about de-risking your ability to execute. I think that's really the most valuable, you know, outcome of getting an MBA from a startup from a, from a founder's perspective. Uh, you know, the odds are against you in a startup, right? By definition, like they're totally against any any founder. You know, the chances of failure are much higher than the chances of success. The failure rates are, in effect, you know, much higher than success. And often you have, especially for technical founders or what I call, you know, uh, technical doesn't necessarily mean like you're a software developer, but it could be you have a skill to say you're, a digit, you're really good in digital marketing or in data science or like, you know, uh, some specific, uh, you know, vertical and you don't have the business background, the price to pay for mistakes is really high in a startup. And I think that's really, I would say, the, the most valuable advice I could sort of give, you know, anyone thinking about getting an MBA that unlike a job, you could make the argument that in a job that you know when you when you make a mistake or don't deliver something correctly or deliver a, whether it's a report or a financial analysis or a model that you deliver in, you know with a bunch of mistakes you know there's someone there that's sort of going to typically check it and evaluate it and push back on it it's unlikely to go to market right away you know done incorrectly um but in a startup, that's not the case. Like if you're the one building your financial model or your projections, or you know, you're or devising your marketing plan or your hiring plan, you know, uh, there's really you hardly ever get a second, a third chance, you know, to, uh, within your own startup. Um, so it really de-risks, um, you know, the 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 execution side of of building a startup very significantly. So that I think there's a lot of value there. Um, connected to the nonprofit element, Ronit, maybe you could just uh, comment on MPAs. We have a number of questions on the value of maybe uh, uh, an MPA in the nonprofit sector, so a master's in public affairs um, in, the, in the public sector compared to an MBA. Uh, how should one evaluate between the value of each? I actually have a slightly stronger feeling about this than I do. And like, should you pursue an MBA or not? I, I think it really depends. Should it be online or in person? It depends. But MPA versus MBA, I actually have a strong bias towards MBA, MBA business, um, because I think that there it's essential that the nonprofit sector and the business sector actually have a lot to learn from one another. They tend to be quite siloed. And frankly, as somebody who went from the nonprofit sector to the private sector, there's a ton of transferable skills, but the, the private sector does not recognize MPA as a credential that is deeply respected, but the nonprofit sector respects an MBA. So I actually think that you would be, unless, there's, unless you're really gonna focus on policy very specifically, and you know that that's something that you wanna, that's your life's passion and journey, you might be better off doing a, an MBA, but then taking a course or two, you know, doing a kind of cross, uh, um, you know, taking a few courses from a school of, of public affairs or, or somehow cross pollinating, because I think the MBA will just be longer term, you know, deeper value. So that's my, um, uh, you know, my two cents on that one. Thank you. Uh, Dan, can I can we uh, talk about your previous uh, career a little bit from an accreditor perspective? Um, you know, when when the creditors are actually looking at outcomes, could you maybe walk everyone through a little bit more of an understanding um, of how does an accreditor um, evaluate the actual return people are getting from these MBAs? And I asked the question, not, not that people need to know the process, but that people, so that people understand that there is some sort of framework that exists 
to actually ensure that degrees being offered uh, do deliver value to those who, who complete those uh, degrees? Sure. You know, uh, first, I should start by um, stating that there are many different types of accreditors out there. Right. Yeah. So yeah. there's not a single accreditor and yeah. not all accreditors do the job um, the same way. But the, the kinds of accreditations that I'm most familiar with will start with the mission of the school. Uh, so the, the school, say Nexford University, if interested in accreditation, will um, you know, describe its mission. Why does it exist? And then the evaluation normally takes place in the context of that mission. Does it deliver on that um, um, mission? And the kinds of evidence the school provides in order to demonstrate that become very important. So they would look at you know, what's happened to the graduates over time. Um, usually that means new schools have a hard time getting accredited because they don't have enough graduates yet, right? <laughs> uh, even though they might be quite innovative and high quality, um, uh, those types of variables simply don't, uh, aren't measurable yet. But I do want to I do want to say that it's a challenge for accreditation in general. You know, nowadays, you know, just as a, a as an example, you know, when you're thinking about buying a product now, you look at a lot of things. But at least from my perspective, the most important thing is to look at what other people are saying about the program. Right. So nowadays you look at things like how, how many likes, for example, but also you look, you begin to drill down and, and look at the, the feedback, you know, what are, what do people like, what do people not like. So in addition to accreditations, I'm always encouraging people to look beyond that and in some sense, look at what the, the people are saying about it nowadays. Um, bad products can simply not exist in the marketplace. Uh, without some visible, visible reaction from um, yeah. the customers. So, um, yeah. you know, in uh, some ways, accreditation becomes less necessary from that perspective. I mean, I'm delighted you say that, Dan, because, I mean, uh, we obviously share that uh, sentiment. Um, and, Ronit, I mean, anything to, to, to add to that? And a platform like, you know, localized, presumably, your know, learners will be able to interact with you know, thousands of other learners, you know, across different uh, universities. In my humble opinion, accreditation, you know, is I think diminishing in value over time, to be honest, just because in many of the frameworks that certain accreditors uh, still follow today were developed a hundred years ago. Um, and therefore they're not so relevant to uh, today's world. Plus when you look at, you know, to, to Dan's point, if I can go and get reactions from, you know, 5,000 people who went through that program and see what they, you know, how they benefit. Is that not much better than a stamp from some other organization? May I, may I just add a, a bit of a, a comment on that? I, what I really was focused is on, is on the customer perspective, but yeah. uh, the real value of accreditation actually, uh, contrary to what most people think, lies in the improvement and the innovation that it creates amongst the schools. Right. So every you know three years, you have a, a group of people that come in and take a deep dive and look at your program and make recommendations about where it could improve, right? So the real value of accreditation, you know, in some sense is less on that customer side and distinguishing between good ones and bad ones, mm. right? But, but rather on uh, supporting the school's ability to, to change, innovate, to adapt to a changing environment. And, and um, my old organization, AACSB, does a super, super job of helping business schools get better, adapt, and create value. Thanks, Dan. Sorry, we, we have, uh, Ranit, we'll, we'll come back to you in a second, but we have a sure. question that we just have to answer because you know, it keeps them coming up. Um, we sort of addressed the earliest from Israel Devine saying if MBA is really worth it, how come the richest man in the world, you know, Bezos and Elon Musk always say they don't hire MBA holders. I could talk on and on about that, but uh, I'll give you guys a chance before while I uh, calm down slightly. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't, I don't care about those guys, but I will say something, you know, there are certain, there are certain people who go to school to go to school, to go to school, to not go out there 
and you know who kind of stay in a protected environment and are afraid to jump and take the risks and do things and so school becomes uh, a way to do something that calms the anxiety about what I'm going to become and those credentials pile up and pile up without actually get you know rolling up your sleeves and 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 doing some of the the challenging work and and school when it comes to getting very in-depth and theoretical on things that we need researchers on that's fantastic right if you want to do PhDs and postdocs and do research forever fantastic because we need that we saw this with epidemiology vir virology etc right but there there are some people that go and pursue master's degrees out of fear right not knowing what they're going to do next and it becomes kind of a fortress I suspect that that may be where some of that critique comes from although it's quite arrogant um, and so what I would say is that if you are an MBA student or you're doing a double master's or you know one of the things that employers are looking for is can you take what you're learning in the classroom and apply it in real life? And how, how are you doing that? And I think Nextford is trying to blur that so that it's not such a binary, that there's no in real life and there's no, you know, it's not like there's the theoretical and then there's the practical, there's the integration of that. And you're seeing that with a lot of business schools and, and master's degrees program now that are trying to integrate that more. The more you can demonstrate your ability to act and make decisions and take risks and do difficult things um, in your life, in leadership, in the working world, the more you can push back on that bias. I think, I think MBA there is being used as a placeholder for endless credentials without actually going out and getting work done. And I don't think it's a, it's not, it's a false choice. So, so let's ignore those guys, <laughs> um, <laughs> but then focus on, you know, uh, how are you going to take the learning and apply it in a way that makes sense for your passions and your interests? Yeah, and, and to add to that, Renita, I mean, you know, we're, we're running over time now. The, the, the reality is both companies, I mean, Amazon more so than Tesla definitely does hire MBAs. I mean, last year alone, Amazon hired about a thousand MBA graduates specifically. Uh, they, you know, they actually changed from sort of campus tours to virtual tours to, to, to hire through these virtual tours, similar to the virtual, you know, job fairs that Localize run. I think to, to your point, if I'm going to go earn an MBA that's really theoretical in nature, it's unlikely that I'll have the actual competencies or the skills that that employer is looking for. And I think the whole argument around the value of a college degree and even the value of an MBA emerged to a large extent because so many schools are so outdated and what they're teaching is so theoretical in nature. So employers started saying, well, if you're gonna come to me you know, with just a bunch of theory, I'm gonna have to retrain you anyway, then I'll, I'll, you skip the credential. But that doesn't mean that the other schools that are focusing on delivering skills that are of real value you know, don't have, they have a tremendous amount of, uh, of value to them. Dan, anything to add to that? Uh, other than that I'm a, um, perhaps a big, bigger believer in theory than you might be, <laughs> but, but I agree <laughs> generally. The, um, you know, I think understanding and, and being able to uh, integrate ideas is, is very important and understanding the broader context of business is very important as well. But, but, but yeah, I, I agree, you know, that these, there are MBAs working for both organizations. I know plenty of companies that say they, they aren't hiring MBAs or won't, but um, either, uh, um, I, I guess, face reality at some point or exactly. <laughs> otherwise don't know what's happening in their organization. But definitely they have great communicators, strategic thinkers, critical thinkers. They hire people that do finance and do it well. Um, they hire marketers um, and all of right. that's part of the MBA. And there's a nuance between, I think, like, we're not going to require an MBA in order to hire you because they don't want you to have to incur 100,000 debt to get a job because then you're going to require $150,000 salary versus, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we won't hire MBAs. That's definitely not the case. They're two very different uh, policies. Totally. But anyway, thank you all for joining. I know we're a bit over time. Thank you so much, Renit and Dan, for taking the time today. And thank you for everyone joining us from across the world. As usual, we will be posting the video on YouTube over the coming day or two, so you'll all get the chance to uh, watch it there. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye. bye.